Aloha, and thank you for once again joining us with A Better Day. I'm Senator Sam Sloan, and for the next half hour, we're going to bring you information, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, stir you to action to do some things. We uh, call this A Better Day because, you know, the governor says a new day and all that. We think that people in Hawaii, particularly taxpayers and, and small businesses and families, deserve a better day. And so far, I'm sad to tell you, I don't think we've gotten that. The legislature is starting to wind down now. Our last scheduled day is May 2nd, and uh, we're getting prepared for the uh, conference committee uh, concept and, and also final bills. We've always cautioned you, bills that people said, oh, don't worry about those because they're dead for the session. Nothing is dead until we're out of there. We go signy die with the gavel and the lights are turned off May 2nd. So no matter what you hear, it's not over till it's over. And it's been an interesting session because uh, there have been a lot of tax bills proposed, a lot of mandates on, on businesses. And, you know, the litmus test I use uh, is a bill going to increase your freedom, increase your variety of choices and your standard of living or not. And sadly, of all the bills, uh, nearly 2,000 bills this year, not one of them really that moved along had an opportunity to do that. So we're faced with what we've got. And what we've got... Uh, is basically it's been more of the same, more taxation, more spending. Uh, people don't seem to realize how to rein in their spending or how to prioritize in this big square building like you have to, like every single mom, every family, every small business. We have to make tough choices, but tough choices have not been made here. You've got more and more people calling for money for their programs, their priorities, and yet we really don't have the money. We're going through collective bargaining with all of the, the unions, the unions want more money. They want more bargaining units. As a matter of fact, we have more than two dozen bills that address union situations. Well, who pays for the unions? The taxpayers do. Small businesses do. And, you know, I know of very few people in our community that have had the luxury of getting a raise. Most people are very happy if they still have a job. Because if you've been reading the papers and following the news, you know that a lot of our benchmark businesses have shut down. A lot of others, are in problem, problem territory. They're having a very difficult time as costs continue to escalate. And at the state level, we've talked before about the tremendous level of unfunded liability that the state faces and the amount of debt. Um, we've talked with the budget director, Calbert Young, who uh, I, I think he's a square shooting guy and he tells it like it is, even though he represents the administration. But he made a statement uh, before the networking breakfast of Smart Business Hawaii uh, back in the end of February saying that if things don't change by 2017 the state will be technically broke. So you thought you had problems with your business and your home. Well you didn't. Well look, I got somebody as a special guest today and we're really fortunate to have him because he is without a doubt the number one expert in terms of uh, fiscal policies and legislative policies. He's been doing it for quite some time. Uh, he is an icon around our community. And he's Lowell Kalapa, who is the president and CEO of Tax Foundation of Hawaii. And Lowell, welcome to A Better Day. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, you know, you and I have had the, the pleasure of knowing each other for a long, long time. We've both been doing this for a long, long time, which always amazes me. You write columns. You speak regularly. Mm -hmm. You get involved in community activities. And still, I'm sure you get the kind of calls that I get occasionally. Why didn't somebody tell me about that? What, when did that tax go up? When, when did this happen and all? And yet we, we do our best to alert and inform people so that they can take action. And it's understandable. People have to work. They have, a lot of people have more than one job, and they just don't have time to sit down. I'm surprised even at uh, the number of people who you know, I deal with every day who don't even read the newspaper. Yeah. I mean, not that you know, it's the best newspaper in the world, but... Hey, it's the best it, Monopoly newspaper we got here. It's a newspaper, and it yeah. records things. And um, I find people... Um, who I deal with every day who don't read the newspapers. So it's not surprising that people don't know what's going on yeah. um, in this little square building here. Well, on oh, the big square. I have to correct you. The big, big square, square building. building. And, and the other part of it is, you know, we in this building from January to May, we think that the whole world revolves around us and everybody is sitting on pins and needles mm -hmm. to find out what we're doing. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I go to community meetings and neighborhood boards and all that. And a lot of the people, they say, oh, are you in session now? <laughs> <laughs> when, when did it start? When did it? Oh, have That's you right. been reelected? We, we don't even know who you are. That's correct. 
And, and that's part of the problem. Hey, before we go any further, though, tell us a little bit about the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, which is well, a very important organization. We've been around for almost 60 years. In fact, we will make our 60th anniversary this year. Oh, that's uh, great. And, you know, I'm not, I didn't found it. I'm, I'm not that quite a old, but I'm the third executive director in, in this chain. And um, what we do is basically do research about public finance policy at the state and local level. So that's why we work with you as the legislature, mm -hmm. uh, the city councils, the governor, and the mayors uh, through the years to form good, hopefully good, tax and finance policy. We watch things uh, not only in the tax area, but the more general public finance area, which is very difficult for a lot of people to understand because you're dealing with a public entity as opposed to a private corporation. Mm -hmm. So the rules are a little bit different, they're a little bit more strict, um, and they're supposed to be a lot more transparent because it's its stockholders basically are the taxpayers. They're the ones that have an interest in this corporation called government. Mm -hmm. And Tax Foundation is not part of the government, not affiliated in any uh, way, is that you correct? Know, so many people say, what department do you work yeah. for? And yeah. I go, no, I work for, <laughs> it's a private nonprofit research organization that um, is independently funded, which makes it awfully difficult. We don't get any state or federal monies, no mm -hmm. county monies. Uh, so we're not obligated to say the right thing politically mm -hmm. uh, to people like you, like legislators or city council people or the mayors or the governor. And oftentimes, you know, it, it's not the politically correct uh, statement to make, but it's the right statement to make about mm -hmm. good public finance policy. Yeah. Well, without the Tax Foundation, I mean, we would not have, when I say we at the legislature, would not have an independent view and an objective view of a lot of the policies and particularly the unintended consequences. And I know that often the, the tax director will defer to you and, and to your testimony, uh, which is good in one way, it's scary in another uh -huh. way. And, and I, I guess I got to say in, in terms of, of full transparency that I had worked at the Tax Foundation many years ago before Lowell was a little boy. He was a little uh, boy growing short up. Pants. Yeah, that, with short pants and mm -hmm. slip on. But uh, it's a wonderful organization. I worked with Fred Benyon. Uh, the Wyoming cowboy right, who, I did was, too. who was the head of, of Tax Foundation. But it's true. Um, Lowell doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't try to uh, say the things that people want to hear. And often they don't want to hear it, do they? they? They probably don't because they know that we're all, ultimately we're going to be in a position to say, I told you so. And, and there's been a number of times that sure. advised and yeah. years later we look back and go, I told you so. Yeah. Well, and you know, that's what I tell people al also. They, they say, gee, I must be frustrated being the only person of my kind down here mm -hmm. in the Senate, mm -hmm. the endangered species. But I stand up and say things because it's all put in that little book, that little journal mm -hmm. that's appeared there. And I remember the first speech I ever made on the Senate floor. I said, look, I, I don't know how you're going to vote on this issue. And, and I probably don't have any influence over that. Over that. But I want to tell you, you're not going to have the luxury years later of saying, oh, is that what that meant? Is that what that does? Nobody told, told me about that. that. So I see you and I having kind of parallel uh, responses to that, trying to let people know, okay, have you thought about this? And Sam, you know, sometimes I get people come up to me and say, thank goodness you're there because we really wanted to say that too, but we can't. I, I And it's too bad because I, th I, re I am of the philosophy that you need to be upfront and honest with people and so that they know where you're coming from and not to have a secret hidden agenda which a lot of the yeah. people which appear before the legislature seems to have they have their own little kind of thing in their back pocket well and, and you know you've been around here long enough and you you've <laughs> probably seen it all and heard it all I, I get very perturbed in committees where somebody comes in and they they're very passionate about something mm -hmm. Um, and the committee knows, first of all, there's no money for it, mm -hmm. uh, very little likelihood politically that it's going to go by, but they pass it uh, kind of, you know, a, as a, you know, a, a satisfactory kind of thing or mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. well, we're for you and all that, knowing full well when it gets to House Finance or, or Ways and Means, it's, n it's not going to go anywhere. I would rather take the approach and tell them honestly, right up front, we don't, we don't have the money or we, there's not the political opportunity to do it, but we don't do that, do we? We pass, pass it along. On, right. Yeah. And people, you know, aren't willing to pronounce that there are priorities for our tax dollars. Yeah. And there are health and safety issues and, and perhaps this one person or this issue may not have as much uh, critical mass because it is not a health and safety issue, but more so something that we probably could do in the private sector right. instead of government doing it because Government can't be, you know, everything to everyone mm -hmm. about everything. And I think that um, a lot of the people who come and supplicate themselves before, before you, the legislature, 
seem to think that everything is of a high priority, especially theirs, <laughs> yes. and they don't they realize that there are other things that are much more critical, the um, health care of our population, mm -hmm. uh, the safety of our children in our schools, the education they get. If theirs is not that high priority, it's not going to get funded, and they should be told that up front. Yeah, I, well, I, I firmly agree with that. And you know, We've seen a multiplicity of organizations, particularly nonprofits, and don't get me wrong, I think nonprofits do a good job, generally speaking. They do a far better job than government in the delivery of, of services and all. But w we've had so many organizations that have grown up in the last decade, particularly, mm -hmm. and they all come in and they ask for money from the legislature. And, and the little secret that people still haven't figured out, we don't have a dime in this, in this building. The only money that the legislature has is money that they confiscate from businesses or, or individuals, individuals to give yeah, to them. Right. And then it becomes kind of like a lottery system, right? The winners and the well, and, the and, and to a certain degree, the legislature has created what what I would call great expectations. You know, they ha keep on saying, "Well, yeah, we'll take care of you." And so all these people yeah. line up, thinking that they're going to get something, mm -hmm. and there's nothing in the pot yeah. at all left to give to them. And so they get their constituents or their members or their supporters all riled up, and they point fingers at you, the legislature, for so being so stingy, uh, when they're really also complaining that taxes are too high. Mm -hmm. You can't have it both ways. You cannot. But they don't make the connection. They don't make the connection. Yeah. And that's the sorry part, is that they have to understand if they want more and more services out of government, they've got to pay for it. And if they don't like paying for it, then they've got to resign themselves that government can do only do the most critical services to preserve the health and safety of our community. Mm -hmm. and, and we would hope that they would do that well. And if they did, they'd get a lot of kudos. But they don't. They don't do the basics, and well, that, that's the problem. Because everybody, every one of you, 25 in the Senate and the 51 in the House, wants to get reelected. Yeah. So you all pander, um, and I'm not trying to point a finger just at you, but you all you pander. You better not. I'm you not all pander to your constituents because yeah. you w need their vote at that next election, yeah. as opposed to being more statesmanlike and saying, these are the greater needs of our state, mm -hmm. and our state is not each county, or Hawaii County, or Oahu County, or Honolulu County. But we move together as a state, so we have to do what's best for the most my, people. My belief is that we're moving farther away from that, that we have more divisiveness than we've ever had. Counties, particularly neighbor islands against Oahu. Correct. Uh, counties competing with counties. Now, the competition part is good, but when it's us versus them, and we certainly see this... You and I remember, you know, after statehood, this was really an exciting place. That's right. We embraced new ideas. We embraced new people. Heck, I was one of those people mm -hmm. that came at statehood. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and everything was new and shiny, and, and people had ideas. Now, first of all, if the idea doesn't come from the big square building, we don't like it automatically. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if it came from the mainland United States, it's, it's suspect. Thirdly, uh, we find a hundred reasons why we can't do it, and... So I, I'm afraid, I, I'm really bullish on Hawaii, always have been, but for the future. And I know we have good people here, but a lot of people have left and are leaving because their incentive has been destroyed. Um, there's no reward for hard work. Mm -hmm. We have more government now probably than most places in the country. We, we lead in food stamps. We're number three or four in taxation, and homelessness is right up in the top. Um, and we have people that come here and testify. Well, here's what you need to do. One, two, three. And then after they come here, we say, well, thank you very much, and we'll do exactly what we've done before, because of the hope and change part that the president wanted back in 2008, we got the hope, but we don't have the change. change. We have no change, right. no right. positive change. Am I, am I off base on that? No, or? I think you are correct. I mean, it's really ironic that on one hand we recognize our visitor industry as being our number one industry mm -hmm. and will continue to be if not grow even more important to us with the decline in federal spending or defense spending here in Hawaii and yet we turn around and beat up the industry as much as we can. We raise their hotel room tax, mm -hmm. um, the governor wants an even higher rate of 11 and a quarter percent, um, the temporary nine and a quarter percent is going to stay, it was supposed to be temporary. Um, and then we, we march against future development of Waikiki, uh, which has been really the bread and butter of the visitor industry. Um, and yet we praise, you know, the, just this last month, um, Hawaiian Airlines added a couple of new lines, uh, air routes from New Zealand and, and Taipei and other places to bring more visitors here. Mm -hmm. We won't have enough beds to put those visitors yeah. in because we won't let development 
take what we have and make it better mm -hmm. and increase the number of bits. And so therefore, um, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. This is, this is the economic engine of our state currently. And if we destroy it, what is there to replace it? And the interesting thing is, uh, everybody and their sister has a way of spending the tranche and accommodation tax, which at one time, as you know, the first thing was, it was going to be earmarked for the convention center. That's correct. And then it was for marketing and, and tourism programs. Now it's for parks and restrooms and, uh, and the flower planning right. and the counties and, and all of that. And, and the argument that was made this year is just fantastic. Because the visitor industry is doing so well, let's tax them even more and Correct. take more of their funds. Correct. And, and here we are, we, we have the, the governor and many in the legislature and certainly the Monopoly newspaper saying, we've turned the corner, Hawaii is really, uh, it's on the upswing and things are getting better. And yet, anybody that I talk to on a daily basis is scrambling and having a harder time than ever before. And I know you and I both know of businesses that are hanging on by the fingernails. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's really terrible because we have visitor industry, construction, the folks are sitting on the, on the bench, retailing is anemic, wholesaling uh, down, manufacturing practically non-existent, mm -hmm. and now the problems with the, the federal government. Um, we don't have that many opportunities. We're talking about uh, a tech industry and expanding that and all that, but some of the basics we're not doing. And you're talking about even not enough hotel room beds. When we look at Waikiki, even though there have been some recent renovations, major renovations, it's still a, a sad you know, it's visitor it's plant, it's right? Not, right? For a major, not, for resort, a major resort area. That's producing billions and billions of dollars of expenditures that then pay the taxes and pay the people that we know as our neighbors. Yeah. And yet we beat up on the industry. I mean, it's, it, it, and it's not unusual. Uh, the same thing, uh, you know, on one hand, your colleagues want to support agriculture here in the state um, yeah, to, replace, <laughs> to replace sugar and pineapple, which the unions happen to beat out of existence yep. um, by having amongst the highest, agricultural, uh, highest paid agricultural workers in the world. And so we forced them out of business because they couldn't afford to pay them much, as much anymore. Mm -hmm. But then you all turn around and say, well, you don't want genetically modified organisms mm -hmm. to be sold in this state. Get rid of corn, get rid either, of papaya. Either get, that yeah. or label it. And it seems to me that it's just the opposite tact. For, those, for sure, those people who know that they have product or they're growing things that are not GMO, mm -hmm. they're the ones that probably should be labeling their product to say, look at me, I'm real proud not to be a well, GMO. Well, didn't we do that with organic? Right, exactly. That was their niche in the market. market. They said, you know, we're organic. organic. We're not grown like that. And, and, and you go into the store, be it Safeway Times or Mom and Pop, mm -hmm. and there'll be a little section that's labeled organic. And for yeah. those people who want the organic product, that's where they go. Um, and so I'm, I just can't understand and, and why your colleagues want to force everybody yeah. who's not well, yeah, you've right. got a lot of community support for it. I mean, I've got people visiting me every day saying, you've got to support GMO. And I said, what is it that you actually want me to do? And we've seen, they, they drop off videos about how horrible everything is. And gee, you can't mention the name Monsanto mm -hmm. or, or Dow here. But I said, well, well what do you want to do in, in its place? And I said, I have no problem with labeling, like some of the papaya growers labeled. And they said, this is non-GMO or this is GMO. Except that you'd find that 99.9% .9 of all the food here in some way is GMO. W what is it that, that you actually want to do? We're not sustainable. We're no closer to being food sustainable now than we were 20 years ago, really. And Probably again, less. It's a definition, you know. Actually, it's a definition, right. Genetically modified organisms date back hundreds of years to Mendel yeah. and the pea. And he's the one that modified. He was the one. Now we got to. Now we can so put the finger on. So where do we it. where do we start? It seems to me that um, if you're going to require labeling of some sort, you require labeling of non-GMO products. So people who want that product mm -hmm. understand that there is no tinge of alteration in it. Yeah. And then just let the farmers do what they want to do. And if they don't want to be particular to non-GMO product, mm -hmm. then they won't be saddled with the additional costs of labeling. You know, you and I, we understand and we celebrate the, the free market. I think more and more the free market has disappeared in Hawaii. We don't believe in competition. We do believe in government established or maintained monopolies. And, and yet the, the, you know, the point is, if you don't like something, 
if you have choices, you go somewhere else. That's correct. You, you do the shopping with your money and with your conscience or, or whatever, but we have people every day coming before the legislature and, and saying, ban this, prohibit that, tax this, regulate, and, and that's, that's the point. And I, I got to tell you, I, I don't do very well with bans and, and prohibitions. And, and they don't understand how all of those laws actually uh, destroy the economy. They make sure that we don't have enough jobs because you ban something, you put somebody out of business, or you put a exactly. worker out of the business. Um, it's like the sugary uh, tax on sugary drinks. So we, you know, put this tax on to fight childhood obesity while ignoring the fact that it's not just sugary drinks, but right. it's these little things that you see kids <laughs> sitting in a corner. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I surprised the group. I said, you know, perhaps the proposal should be we tax all of these handheld devices at two hundred dollars a pop. Oh, there boy, was then you just, really have opposition. There was just such a moan <laughs> in the group. <laughs> yeah. But it's true, Sam. It is true. When you look at the way we ran around the playground and hit the tether ball and climbed the gymnasium and slid down the slides, we were so active as kids. And you walk to the playground today, and they're all sitting in corners texting each other. Well, the other thing is we couldn't wait to get out of the house. That's exactly it. And there were it. plenty of things to do. And right. now you've got kids sitting on sofas texting each other across the sofa. Fun. Well, and, and, you know, what I've said before the health committee and all, is that, hey, that's the parents' responsibility. And more and more, uh, I think we're following the New York City model, more and more we've got the nanny state where the government is going to do the things that they say the parents should do. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, a responsibility of parents and taxpayers to get involved. Take back your responsibility and, and, and freedom. And that's the problem is that I don't think there is the kind of family life that you and I grew up with, where we sat around the table right. and we had dinner together, yep. uh, and we heard about everybody's day, and we and our parents told us to eat the vegetables. I <laughs> think parents today are so busy taking their kids to soccer tournaments and that they just swing through that drive-through and get the, those greasy hamburgers, and, the, and mm, then they love they those greasy hamburgers. Then they yeah. regret that their kids are obese. Well, yeah. you know, you, you got to do something about that. Menu. Well, it's a disconnect. It's like well, like we were saying earlier about the disconnect between taxes and and more government and, and less economic mm -hmm. freedoms. People don't, they don't put the things together because I think there's a, a definite lack of critical thinking today. We're not getting it in the schools, even some of the private schools. Uh, you know, you pay a lot of money, but you're not teaching people to think. What you're teaching them to do is to get in lockstep and say, well, I like oh, to call it's global it warming. Common sense. Common sense. Well, that's a, that's, that's a resource that's in short supply. Look, we're, we're short on time. Tell us what you think is going to come out of this legislative session. Anything good, anything bad? Uh, well, you know, um, we haven't exactly had time to look at the Senate's version of the budget at this point. I know you're about to go into conference. The version that we've had time to look at was the House version. And apparently the House is taking a much sharper knife this year than in the past and paring down the governor's budget by almost, I think it's almost 300 400 million dollars, which yeah. is the first time in a number of years. Well, that's true. Although the the budget that the governor submitted was what eight percent the first fiscal year and eleven percent higher the second right. year. So, more spending, more programs like the right. very costly early education program right. and and other programs as well. And it's scary to to think that we're going to allow government to get into yet another program when the track record has not been all that great. Well, my my objection to it has been look. Uh, show me the improvements in the K through 12 education system. Uh, everybody says, well, you're getting them a, a you know, running start to get in the system. I'm saying, yeah, in the government education system, but that, that's not necessarily a good thing. And, and one of the things we yeah. have to recognize, Sam, is that although there has been such a bent in the Department of Education, the Board of Education, to get people, or our kids, geared to go to a four-year college, not all kids are interested. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, one of the reasons why many of our kids drop out of school is because they would rather put their hands to work as opposed to reading out of a book, getting ready for a four-year college education. And we're losing those kids. We're yeah. losing them. And we need to have programs that keep them engaged so that at least they get out of high school with a diploma and some skills that they can take into the workforce. So it doesn't come down to if we only had more money. It really comes it's down to leadership, creative, and, leadership and creative <coughs> thinking and the willing to partner uh, with the private sector. Great. Yeah. Well, there's many more things that we can do. The one thing I wanted to say, again, about, about you, Lowell, you, you are active in the community. You have a special interest in, in housing and, and homelessness and all of that. You've done that. But over the years, I, I think your insight has been valuable. So tell us again, if people want to know more information about the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, 
How can they contact they you? They can go to our website, which is TF for Tax Foundation, TF Hawaii spelled out, H A W A I I dot O R G. And there's not a lot, a really a lot of information on that website. Our uh, weekly commentary is located there, which is also carried in. Uh, Civil Beat, the, the neighbor island newspapers, um, <coughs> uh, you know, and I think that it's important for them to just know a little bit more about their government finances because we're all, as I said, stockholders in government. That's great. Well, it's a great attitude, and, and we appreciate everything you've done, particularly Thank the you. digesting and the, and the testimony. And we want to tell people, don't give up. There are things that they can do, right? And we need to hear from you, and your elected officials need to hear from you. <coughs> we certainly do. <coughs> I get choked up when I hear that. <laughs> anyway, our special guest has been Lowell Kalapa of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, and we urge you to uh, use their resources and to help them. <coughs> As I lose my voice, this is Sam Sloan thanking you, and <coughs> we'll see you again on a better day. <coughs> Aloha. <coughs>